Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Robson, the Medical Director here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And welcome to this, the eighth in our exciting lineup of QI Connect WebEx sessions for 2017. The 38th, in fact, since we began the series four years ago. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement, innovation, and integration. We've designed these sessions to be short, accessible, and recorded to allow access at a time that suits you. I'm now going to pass you over to Jennifer, who'll tell you a little bit more about the session and the technology we're going to use. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Good afternoon, Brian, and good afternoon to everyone who is on the call. It's great to have you all on. I am just going to do a couple of quick housekeeping slides just to get us started on how to use WebEx. Um, if you could please use the chat function that you see on the right hand side of your screen to communicate and I'll talk you through that in just a moment. Um, and if you are having any technical difficulties such as not to be able to hear the presenter speak or if you keep losing connection then please message the event manager using the chat function or by pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. These sessions are designed to be fun and interactive, um, so we've just highlighted there how to use the chat function. Um, so you'll see the top right hand side of your screen, there's the chat icon. If you can just click on that and then down at the bottom you'll see um, a box to send your message. So just put your message in there and click send. So. We did promise that our session today was going to be fun and interactive. And um, so we're it's delighted to have so many QI connectors joining us from all over the world today. We have 15 countries who have registered. Um, we're just going to ask you to tell us where you're joining us from. So if you can just click on the annotation tool that you see circled in the red, it looks like a pen and then click on the arrow icon that you can also see there. And then click on the map to show us where you're dialing in from. Lots of people in the UK, welcome Sean and Doug as well, linking in from Canada. Great to see so many QI connectors from across uh, North America. Uh, and all the way across the UK. Uh, I'm not sure if we're joined by David Grayson and the crew down in New Zealand. But they'll, they'll pop up later if they're on the call. Uh, but you're all very, very welcome. Uh, hi, uh, Aileen from Ayrshire. And I see uh, Alistair's already on the uh, chat function saying it's sunny in Edinburgh. Well, today it's sunny in Glasgow as well. Uh, and hi uh, from uh, Montreal uh, also. Great to see so many folks. Uh, Carolyn's just finding herself across uh, Tenerife, maybe. Oh, nope, nope, heading across across the world. Great to see so many QI connectors. Thanks very much, Jennifer. And just to remind everyone that uh, QI Connect is now reaching uh, almost 700 um, organisations uh, registering for uh, QI Connect. And as Jennifer mentioned. Um, we're now reaching out all over the world. Uh, and uh, as is always the case for QI Connect, uh, we've got a bit of a competition. Now, we're still uh, with uh, 53 countries uh, across the world. I'm going to ask you to put your, get your arrows at the ready. Um, and I'm going to name one of our countries. And it's the first one to uh, get their uh, arrow on the correct flag, they'll win an amazing prize. In fact, today, two amazing prizes. So the country today that we want you to identify is the country flag of Bahrain. The country flag. Oh, well done, Stuart Duncan. Uh, nearly, uh, Ailey, that's very close. Well done, everyone. So Stuart Duncan, uh, congratulations on getting us to, um, to, uh, to Bahrain. Uh, Stuart's an improvement advisor at the Scottish Government. So well done, uh, Stuart. You're very welcome, and you'll be delighted to hear that you've got a couple of prizes uh, coming your way. You get, of course, the much-desired QI Connect mug and a special supply of chocolate ice cream 
uh, as used by astronauts. More to follow later. But congratulations, Stuart, uh, for identifying uh, Bahrain. And uh, I see the comments in the chat box saying the weather in Scotland actually is quite amazingly sunny today across Scotland. So thanks for keeping us up to date, uh, Aileen uh, and, uh, and Stuart. Now, those organisations, uh, when we started QI Connect, we had one page of your wonderful logos. And now we have 18 slides covering the logos from your almost 700 organisations. It's so good to see all of you uh, join and continue to connect across the world uh, as QI Connect reaches out and connects people together around innovation, improvement, and integration. And it's always a great pleasure to be able to say that the whole of NHS Scotland, looking after the 5.3 million people here in Scotland, connects in with QI Connect. Wonderful to have so many uh, QI Connectors all across Scotland. And it's always a particular pleasure to call out the 61 universities uh, who are now dialed in to and using the QI Connect uh, resources. Wonderful to see uh, all of those wonderful universities. And we're absolutely delighted today to say that we've got 22 new organisations uh, from uh, across the UK and further afield. A particular shout out to the Army Medical Services, to Dr. Ronan Murphy, who's linking in from the UK here from the Army Medical Services. Big shout out to the Mongol Foundation here in Glasgow, charitable organisation in Glasgow, and to our friends at KPMG who are joining us for the first time. But we're delighted with our friends from Dorset, from Vister, uh, and also from the Inlet uh, Hospital in Norway and many others. You are very, very welcome as first time QI connectors. And as Jennifer mentioned, we are recording the sessions so that you can reuse the sessions. These are our friends in Kuawatea in New Zealand uh, who told us for the very first time about how they were using recordings uh, from the uh, sessions that we run in QI Connect. You're very welcome to use any and all of the recordings. Uh, they're all available on the Healthcare Improvement Scotland website um, and we're delighted that you can use them in classroom teaching and personal learning and just for a bit of fun uh, when you want to. Always, always a pleasure to call out to our friends in the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, the ISQA organization, and their fellowship program who use the uh, QI Connect webinar series as part of their approved resources. And we're absolutely delighted in 2017 to have started a new partnership with the Health Foundation, uh, the Q uh, program, and NHS Improvement. Uh, the Health Foundation is an independent charity committed to bringing about better health and care uh, for the people in the UK and further afield. And NHS Improvement is responsible for overseeing Foundation Trust and NHS Trust and independent providers in England. And the Q initiatives and the Q uh, connectors are all over the UK. We're absolutely delighted uh, to have you uh, join QI Connect. And the QI Connect small but perfectly formed team are here today in the studio. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer and myself, you've heard from us already. Uh, Carmen, uh, who does all the certification and registration. Shout out to Michelle, who's also on registration and helping us with the session today and resources today. And Alex, who's on Twitter uh, to keep our reach. Um, we're also joined today in the studio with, uh, by uh, Katrina Ingram, uh, who's the leadership fellow and a psychiatrist in training here in Scotland. You're all very welcome. And more to come shortly, but our, our uh, questioner today, for the first time ever, uh, is, uh, is a Callum Perry. Uh, we'll hear from Callum just in a moment. And Callum's dad, you see in the, in the photograph uh, also, Colin. Uh, Colin's a consultant in diabetes and endocrinology at Greater Glasgow in Clyde and work very closely as one of Healthcare Improvement Scotland's national clinical leads. So we're delighted to have Callum and Colin uh, on the call today. And a really big shout out to Callum's uh, class, which is uh, Primary 4 at Bearsden Primary School in the north of Glasgow. And it's Miss Kernahan's um, class, the P4 class at Bearsden Primary School. So a really big shout out. This is the first time that we've ever had um, uh, um, a young person uh, ask the question, and a particular shout out to the P4 at Bearsden Primary. Now, remember to tweet 
Uh, Alex can't do this on her own, but please help Alex and the team here reach as far as we can using the hashtag HISQIConnect and follow us at HISQIConnect. So that brings me today to talk about today's speaker. Well, you know that QI Connect has always had high aspirations, and today we reach our highest aspiration yet, outer space. Our QI Connect speaker today is a science graduate, a physics graduate, a medical graduate, an engineering graduate, and a medical science graduate, so he's smart. He's an emergency medicine doctor and can also play the guitar. Dr. Tom Marshburn is also a fully qualified and highly experienced astronaut with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, more commonly known as NASA. Welcome to QI Connect, Tom. Hello, it's very good to be here. It's, it's a delight and an honor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, the uh, three words you mentioned uh, regarding integration, improvement, and innovation, uh, one of the reasons why it's such a joy to work at NASA. Regarding integration, um, I'll be showing you some videos of my space flights and looking at the International Space Station. I ask you to think about how that uh, vehicle got into space. In my mind, it is the, the best physical embodiment of integration, where countries from around the world uh, built the space station in space, uh, developed their particular parts of the station in their countries, knowing full well that they had to match perfectly with almost zero tolerance for any inaccuracy in the vacuum of space in orbit. The uh, collaboration that has occurred to build this and to continue to run it is just astounding, and I, I think it's one of mankind's greatest achievements. Um, but we'll just go ahead and roll the video. I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, I've had the, uh, the privilege of, of doing as a NASA astronaut. I was selected in 2004, and then in 2009 went on my first space flight with this crew here. This is at the Space Center in Florida. I'm there with my crew in the orange suits. We are at the um, bottom of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Uh, that is the flight deck crew. That is the commander and the pilot in their spacesuit strapping in on launch day. That's me in the far uh, outboard part of the uh, space shuttle. And there's the flight deck just prior to launch. And as our white uh, gang plate, uh, gangplank kind of uh, pulls away, we're by ourselves in the cabin as we get ready for the launch of the space shuttle Endeavour in uh, July of 2009. Our job was to bring uh, parts up to the space station and do a, a resupply, both the equipment on the outside and on the inside of the space station. Uh, this moment of launch uh, was my first space flight. It's a mixture of, uh, of how uh, many might have felt as, as one of the best holidays of your childhood, Christmas in my case, uh, the night before that, but also uh, the day before a final exam. So some stress and absolute excitement uh, just prior to going into space. You see the shuttle Endeavour doing a pirouette there below the space station. Uh, we would do that to check for any damage on launch. And then we'll fast forward uh, after that uh, mission, I was assigned to live on board the, space, the International Space Station for about half a year. This time, though, I launched on a Russian ICBM called the Soyuz inside of a Soyuz capsule. We, uh, when we launch, you know, we're just sitting on a launch pad in both cases in the U.S. and in Russia. We experience about uh, two to four Gs, the force of gravity through our chest coming up, and here you're going to see us in the cabin and a bit of a bump there as we do our staging on the launch. But then you get into space. We're traveling 17,500 miles an hour, about uh, 250 to 300 miles above the Earth, and there's the space station. Here's a quick little tour of the inside of the space station. It's a, a strange aquarium in zero G with lots of, that's an empty spacesuit there. We're, we're getting all kinds of equipment ready to do some spacewalks on our shuttle flight. Then as we uh, travel through the space station, we leave the, we call it the United States orbital segment, and then into the Russian segment. And you see the, the different colors, the different layout, uh, two countries in parallel, uh, not meeting until the time of the International Space Station to uh, be able to live inside of each other's spacecraft. 
There's Roman Romaninko, who is our Soyuz commander. We're traveling through a um, stowage compartment. Now, living in space here, we're back in the U.S. side, it requires about two and a half hours of exercise per day. So we have that stationary cycle. We have a treadmill that we can run on. These are all things to keep our muscles strong and our bones strong, the, uh, and particularly our cardiovascular systems. This device here, resistive exercise device, provides us with up to 600 pounds of equivalent resistance and has really made the biggest difference to enable us to live in space for, as far as we can tell, uh, almost any amount of time. Now, after a workout, uh, we have to clean up. Chris Hadfield is my crewmate. He's demonstrating what it's like to try to mess with water. We don't have any running water, so we have to get water out of our packets. Uh, Karen Nyberg is an astronaut showing how uh, someone uh, washes their hair. Shell Lindgren is uh, just doing daily hygiene as we get ready to start our day. Now, at any moment during the day in the space station, you have to fly from one, mo one place to the next. So working there is an absolute joy. It's a punishing schedule. We are going all the time. Probably uh, a good estimate would be that we're actually working about 14 hours a day, um, and then about two and a half hours of exercise, doing a little bit of homework. Uh, around mealtime, though, that's one of the, the best times of the day uh, for both the Russian and U.S. Uh, crews and our inter international partners. Uh, you, that's some dehydrated food that I'm hydrating there. You can probably tell that's some delicious scrambled eggs those that I'm uh, mixing up. And we have our, our kitchen is just a, a box that's on the uh, ceiling, actually, of the space station. I'm the cook today, so I'm rehydrating the food. And all we do is just place our feet on the wall, and uh, we are able to float up there in front of the, the galley. And now we're going to fast forward to one thing that happened during our mission. About three days before I was due to come home, on the, nominally at the end of the mission, we had a problem on the outside of the space station, and so my crewmate, Chris Cassidy, and I had to go outside and do a spacewalk. Our crewmates are closing the hatch so that we can get outside, and some of the most spectacular videos I've ever seen from space um, are following here. Now, this is a compilation of GoPro videos from several uh, spacewalking crew members. I think it gives you a better idea of what it's like to actually be on the outside of the space station doing a spacewalk. Keep in mind that on the sunny side here, like this astronaut, and uh, this one here, here's Shane Kimbrough as he's coming across the truss of the space station, you can feel the heat. It's about uh, it's over 200 degrees uh, centigrade on the outside of the sun that's coming directly on to you from the, in a vacuum of space. You see the little thin cable there that uh, Shane Kimbrough is having to sort of keep out of his way, but it is his lifeline to the space station. If he were to let go right now, that would be the thing that would keep him from floating away forever um, and, uh, and be, be his own satellite. We want to avoid that, obviously, so that's why we have that lifeline. And you can see him put a hook there That's uh, just so he can remove his hands and uh, not even float very far from the space station. But a very exhilarating uh, experience. Spacewalks, launch, and landing, those are the three most dangerous parts of a uh, space flight. Uh, they're also some of the most um, fun and exciting as well. So here, uh, at the end of a spacewalk, towards the end of the day, you can see the, uh, the sunset. We have 16 sunrises and sunsets per day. We go around the world uh, every 90 minutes, so that's why that happens. And. Uh, Seems like the, the video has gone blank there. There we go. But the majority of our time is doing science. That is what we're there in space to do. The um, uh, space station is a laboratory. One of the things that we're able to do is take experiments into the, uh, from the Japanese airlock and launch them into their own orbits ar um, around the Earth. This is a, actually a commercial company. This is one of the first uh, commercial endeavors to uh, bring experiments up and launch it for laboratories on the ground. The three crew members you see here are getting ready to work the robotic arm. They're in the, uh, one of the best places on the space station where the big windows are called the cupola. And they're driving that uh, robotic arm, Canadian built, to a satellite to grab it. Here's another satellite coming in, SpaceX. And a different crew is going to grab that one. 
And what we do is we grab the satellites that fly up to us and we bring them over to the side of the space station and dock it. And that is how we get our supplies, our food, some water, uh, but mostly experiments. The SpaceX uh, in particular is able to take our experimental results, our blood, our urine, uh, plants, other things that we've been working with, and bring them back to Earth. So here's a, an astronaut uh, unpacking the SpaceX Dragon. That's myself and Chris Hadfield. We are packing our uh, Dragon capsule with experimental results. See that big box? It can weigh about 200 pounds, and no problem to uh, just float that around in zero G. The problem with zero G is things like trying to find a place to uh, put your coffee or put your pencil, because things float away from you. But some experiments that we can do in space are fluids experiments, materials experiments. Uh, there, are, there are flame propagation experiments. We've discovered uh, certain uh, phenomena with flame propagation that had never been known before because we're actually able to see it without the buoyancy effects of gravity. One of my favorites is this capillary flow experiment intended to look at how fuel would behave in uh, propellant tanks, but it ends up having a lot of medical implications, which I can uh, talk about later. We are growing some plants in space. This has uh, been a new thing that we can actually grow something that we can eat, but that's, that was an interesting thing. Uh, the crew member is looking at their retinas, doing eye exams. I'm demonstrating how you can use water uh, as your impedance uh, matching medium to do an ultrasound in space. That's my hand. I'm doing an ultrasound of uh, a crewmate, uh, looking at their spinal cord, actually, which you can do with ultrasound, as it turns out. And then two astronauts are filling up uh, for return to Earth some, uh, some, uh, some experimental results kept at negative 80 degrees. Here's that wonderful uh, place I've talked about, the window into space that we have on the space station. When you uh, fly in space and you come home, you're not allowed to bring anything back with you. And the only thing you have is really your memories and your pictures and your videos. So every astronaut will uh, take videos so they can show their family and friends and that they can remember their flight by. Most of the videos obviously are, obviously are of the Earth. That is the favorite pastime when we have a few moments. We will uh, uh, look out the window. This is the Alps at sunset. This is the aurora borealis as we pass over at night. And then you're seeing uh, cities at night, London on the left, Paris on the right as we pass over Europe and into Eastern Europe. Our Soyuz crew, that's the three of us there, at the, our, we had just finished uh, completing our emergency spacewalk. We are in our suits. We're climbing back into our Soyuz capsule, a very tiny place. Uh, it's like a, a very small car in the front seat, and all three of you are packed in there with your spacesuits on. You'll see the three of us getting uh, strapped in there. There's almost not enough room for the hatch. But um, the physics are, are very fascinating. Once we close the hatch, just some very simple springs will push us away. That's our view uh, of our video from our video camera as we leave the space station. But then your engine fires and slows you down, so Earth's gravity takes over and we fall down through the atmosphere. That's a view out the window. So we are, essentially we are a shooting star at that moment and that's what it looks like. When we come out from that moment, we're under a parachute and then we hit the Earth at about a 20 mile per hour uh, impact with the Earth, a, a bit like a car crash, but we'll, we are well protected and uh, it's quite a jolt. Uh, it's very exciting, but uh, not injurious at all. So at the end of the mission, uh, the uh, Russian search and rescue comes and pulls us out of the capsule. We were very happy to be back home again, smell grass, feel wind. I was not feeling that great. The nervous vestibular system has a, a hard time readapting to, uh, to 1G. That happens uh, to astronauts. One of the medical things we need to figure out uh, when we go to other, other planets. But you see a happy crew there that, uh, at the end of their six-month mission. So just a, a little, a real quick segment. Um, this is all digitally rendered video of what NASA is going to be doing in the next uh, starting the next few years and over the next couple of decades. This is the space launch system. It'll be taller than the Saturn V, and we're going to be launching a new vehicle called the Orion. Going back to the capsule days, uh, it's bigger than Apollo, but looks a little bit like it. Uh, the European propulsion module that is going to be used to push astronauts 
uh, out of low Earth orbit and into lunar orbit, a very a wide, large lunar orbit. Astronauts will be uh, in the 2020s. Uh, we expect we'll be orbiting the moon for the first time since the uh, 60s. And the intent then will be to uh, perhaps start beginning to build structures that will take us even deeper into space and do that in lunar orbit. I have this reentry segment because reentry is it's particularly difficult. So one of the things that allowed us to go to the moon is to build a heat shield that could withstand this 25,000 mile an hour um, entry into the atmosphere. The Soyuz uh, parachute uh, landing is much like this in the sense that we get these drogue parachutes that stabilize us and then they release and you uh, free fall and have another uh, series of chutes, your main chutes come open. It's uh, quite a thrilling experience and that is the way we're going to be coming back from space just like they do in the Soyuz, uh, how we're going to come back from space in the near future. We're going to go back to water landings. Uh, both the commercial companies uh, in general and uh, the Orion certainly shown here will be doing a water landing again. And we can, we'll start seeing this unmanned vehicle uh, maybe next year, uh, but then crews inside of it in the early 2020s. So uh, that is all I had on the video, and I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions. Wow, Tom. The, the chat box has just been, it, it's been exciting, but people have been really studying the video and listening to what you're saying. What an amazing, amazing uh, uh, insight into what happens uh, in, in space. Quite, quite amazing. Um, now let's, uh, let's uh, skip back to, uh, to Bear's Den and to our questioner of the moment. Uh, Jennifer, we're going to bring Callum back up. Um, but uh, Callum, you're on the call. Who were your heroes when you were eight years old and what inspired you to become an astronaut? Who were my heroes when I was eight years old and what inspired me to become an astronaut? I, I tell them, for me, my heroes were actually my family. I was the youngest of seven children. So all my brothers and sisters uh, were, uh, some of them were a good bit older than me. Um, my parents uh, always encouraged us to to uh, just study hard school is important and take care of yourself. Uh, but they let us do whatever we wanted to uh, as long as we were doing those two things. And I watched my brothers and sisters and I, I would, didn't even know it at the time. But now when I look back, I know that I was following in their footsteps and I was uh, trying to be like them. Now I did see the moon line landing when I was nine years old. And so astronauts, you know, Neil Armstrong and the other astronauts became my heroes at that time. Um, and I would say that um, probably Neil Armstrong was my biggest astronaut hero while I was growing up. But I became interested in the space program when I began to read ab about it. Uh, I'll never forget the day that I pulled out a book and read about the Apollo 13 uh, spacecraft. You might read about that sometime when the astronauts almost did not survive, when they were trying to get to the moon. Uh, but all the engineers and the army of people that saved their lives, uh, getting them back to Earth safely again, was very inspiring to me. And that's what got me on a path to wanting to work for NASA. Whoa. Callum, what do you think about that? I think he thinks that his, his dad is his hero too. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking that was Colin speaking there, but I'm sure, uh, yeah, it's good to have your dad as your hero. Well, that's a great question, Colin. Thank you so much for asking. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, Callum. Thanks, Colin. Stay with us. Uh, in the chat box, uh, Tom, uh, a lot of physiological things being asked, uh, but let's, before we get to the uh, physiological, one of the questions from Tina Ryan, who's a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow and a Registrar in Old Age Medicine, Geriatrics. Her question is, how much of NASA's success is due to its rigorous selection process? So, um, quite a bit, actually. If we're just talking about the astronaut corps, then we're talking about um, minimizing the risk of any medical problems on orbit. And the best way to do that is to select people that, as far as you can tell, don't have any medical issues that would become a problem later on. Um, a lot more people can become astronauts today than used to be able to. Um, 
but so they're so they're all they're always modifying their uh, selection criteria, getting more conservative in some ways than in others. But selection is the most important uh, health risk mitigator for the astronaut office. For flight controllers and flight directors, that is uh, not to the same degree, but it's still true. They have to go through a physical exam because they're monitoring the console uh, and watching over a hundred billion dollar uh, spacecraft. So that's important as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Tom. Uh, Laura Doby, who's a knowledge and information skills specialist here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, uh, loves the idea of being able to float about the office. Uh, so she, she loved your video of floating about the office. But Anne Hanley, who's an operations manager here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, was asking, are there any long-term impacts or indeed benefits to your body from being in space for so long? There are long-term long impacts. Probably the most ubiquitous and uh, subtle is the radiation. We get very high doses of radiation. In my six-month mission, I got about five times what a, an annual limit is for, the, for a ground and, uh, radiation worker. Um, so uh, we'll see. We don't really know yet how that impacts astronauts and their, and their longevity. Uh, not enough of us have died yet to be able to say with any certainty what happens with that. But that's uh, probably the one risk that we um, uh, don't have a good handle on being able to protect against, particularly as we go leave the protection of the Earth's magnetic um, field and go deep into space. Now, regarding atrophy, the accelerated aging that is caused by zero G, um, because our bones and our muscles are not working at all unless we exercise them deliberately, that is largely being solved um, with those machines that I showed you. So that's one of the greatest successes of of what we've learned from the space station and keeping people up in space for long periods of time. Um, there are some things that pop up every now and then. I do have a, a permanent change in my vision. It's a, a, a new phenomenon, a relatively new one that we've found out about. Um, there are ways around it, you know, obviously with the, the right prescriptions and stuff, but I'm one of those people that experienced that. Um, we think it's related to uh, increase in intracranial pressure, et cetera, but um, we, we're not quite sure yet. Wow, and uh, so, so we're hearing from, so Aileen K uh, Kelman's on the line, and Aileen's in fact the reason, one of the reasons we're having this great call, uh, because uh, Aileen visited with, uh, with NASA as part of her Scottish Quality and Safety Fellowship, um, and put us in touch with uh, your friend and colleague Nigel Packham, who's with you just now in Houston. But Aileen was just highlighting the connection between inactivity and muscle loss, particularly for elderly people in hospitals. In fact, she shared with us some data, uh, as did uh, Katie Lean from Oxford uh, Academic Health Science Network, that 10 days of bed rest in the elderly is equivalent to 10 years of muscle loss. I, I mean, I, I guess you, from, from NASA and from the work that you've been doing, you, you may have thought about uh, how you, you help people understand that back here in, in, uh, for the elderly in beds. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, the microgravity, we call it that sometimes, zero G, um, is in my mind an accelerated aging process just uh, from, the, from the atrophy, from the radiation. Um, and so we experience both cardiovascular and musculoskeletal and even neurologic atrophy. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it's hard to, to walk. And even when we stand up, our cardiovascular response isn't adequate to keep the, our blood in our head. Uh, so we have to do all these things I mentioned. Um, so uh, what we're learning, we think, is, is um, very applicable to people in chronic bed rest, ICU patients, uh, elderly who are unable to get up and move around, even to the point of uh, better defining our diets, what's the best way to, without using too much protein, um, which can uh, leach out uh, bone, um, bone mineral to a certain degree, but particularly with foods without too much salt in it, because uh, that can also have a negative effect on uh, bone um, mineral density. So they're, they're continuing to dig down deeper to see how, how we can uh, preserve um, these uh, bodily systems as best we can. But the analogy is, I think, very real and, and very close. Yeah, just sticking with the physiological, uh, Lorna Dugans, who's a team lead physio at NHS Fort Valley, was asking, does zero gravity affect healing? 
It's a great question. We've been asking ourselves that uh, a lot. There have been some um, observations from crew members. Uh, typically, the only wounds we see are from uh, blood sticks and IVs, which we have to do for experiments. Uh, there's been some subjective comments that they felt that the uh, healing process was a little slower. We've not been able to observe that, actually. I only know of one laceration in space when someone hit their head on a, on a hatch, and uh, I, that seemed to, to heal up just fine. Um, there are some changes in the immune system. You do see demargination of white blood cells in stressful times like uh, landings and, and such. Um, there might be some upregulation of um, some of our immune response when it comes to allergic reactions. We, we do see some dermatologic issues that crop up a little more often than they do on the earth. So um, nothing that's not easily uh, treatable and manage, managed easily by the medical kits. But uh, so while I would say there, I think there are immune changes, it's unclear to us exactly how that would affect healing so far. Well, we seem to be on a run with physiological, so we'll stick with it. So uh, Aileen Kelman, who I've mentioned already, is a, a geriatrician in NHS Fife and, and leading the way in many of the, the, um, the areas of improvement for older people if they get admitted to hospital. Uh, Aileen was asking, she'd be interested to hear a bit more about the nutritional research uh, linked to bone and muscle health and how that might apply in older people's care. Uh, have you been involved in that much, Tom? I have been, uh, but as a guinea pig, as a subject. So um, the experiment I was involved in is called PRO-K, P-R-O-K, the letter K. <clears throat> and it's a, it was an um, attempt to, um, they've gotten a lot of astronauts. I think they've uh, completed the study, actually. Uh, Scott Smith uh, and Sarah um, Zwart, I believe it is, here at the Johnson Space Center have been publishing on it. Um, and so, um, and I'm sure we can get you, get you the um, publications on this. But it has to do with uh, vegetable protein and the fish protein in particular to supplant some of the uh, protein that we have been eating more of in space. In space, you tend to lose weight, um, and uh, muscle tends to also kind of uh, transfer into, into fat, if you will, as it atrophies. At least that component um, tends to decrease. And we've been able to reverse it. I, I came back having gained weight from my space flight, but having lost uh, fat. I gained lean mass. So that was all, in my mind, a, a success and something that we're striving for. Um, but those, um, uh, those two investigators in that study was the one I was involved in. Yeah, that would be great, Tom. We'll, we'll reach out and get the uh, reference on that and, and pass that on. Uh, thanks for that great uh, question, uh, Aileen. Uh, now, uh, Arvind Varaya, who's a Scottish Patient Safety Fellow and a National Clinical Lead here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland for Medicines and a, a physician through in, in uh, Edinburgh, he was asking, uh, how do astronauts deal with the uh, short, light, dark cycle, i.e. the sleep cycle? How does that affect you? Well, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, I wouldn't have thought flying up there there would be a big deal, but it actually is. So. Um, you don't notice it at all. You're basically in a cave inside of a spaceship most of the time. So your zeitgeist, the things that key off what you, uh, how your day starts and ends, is, is basically it's, it, it is Greenwich Mean Time is what we go by, but that's totally arbitrary. We, um, uh, for me, what actually knows uh, lets me know the day is really starting, other than than just looking at my timeline that's uplinked to us. It start start here communications. Uh, from the ground to uh, the, the space station, which is, is fairly common and, and uh, almost continuous. If it weren't for that, um, my body probably wouldn't know what time of day it was. When you look out the window, though, everything changes. It's amazing to me that I could be ready for bed, look out the window, the sun happens to be dawning, because that's where we are in the orbit, uh, and suddenly I'm awake and I want to get a cup of coffee and read the paper because that's what I would <laughs> read the news because that's what I would typically do and it make it somewhat difficult to go to sleep. Likewise, in the middle of the work day, if you're looking out the window and you see a sunset, see all the beautiful colors in the clouds below that we see with a, a gorgeous sunset, I, I start to uh, get kind of cozy and I want to want to go to sleep. So we have medications to help us sleep when we need to. They're not necessary by any means for for most of the, the mission, but when we have to do sleep shifting, we, if we need to, uh, there's some protocols we can use to take some uh, sleep aids. 
but uh, typically they try to handle that with the smart scheduling for us. Wonderful. And Belinda Robertson, who's a professional advisor on permanence in the Early Years Collaborative, now that, that's a national collaborative, perhaps the first in the world, uh, uh, Tom, to try and really study the early years of life and how that affects you in later life. Uh, and trying to put a lot of support in there around families. And one of the things that they've studied from the physiology of uh, you know, young children, really young children, is their cortisol levels are high. They're getting stressed all the time, and that has a lifelong effect on them. So Belinda's asking the question, do you uh, measure your cortisol le reg uh, levels regularly, and what can you do to reduce them when you're in space? That's, that is uh, fascinating. I've, um, there have been studies where our cortisol measure, our levels have been measured, um, a, a number of them, particularly in the shuttle program. Uh, I don't know of any ones right now. I imagine that they are measured on me as part of the suite of things that are measured just standard uh, before I launch and after I come home. Uh, but I think a quick literature search would, would pull some of that data out. Um, they're, they're probably quite high when we get into space and right when we get back home. I've always likened arrival into space, particularly your first time, as <laughs> is what it must like. If we could remember what it was like to be born, this is what it would feel like, simply because everything is brand new, everything. Um, you're, you're on edge because you know you're in a dangerous place. You have to <clears throat> learn how to uh, move around <clears throat> in zero-G. You have to learn how to, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> You have to learn again how to put your clothes on, how to brush your teeth. You don't know where to put things. Things are floating around. You're getting used to a new schedule. So um, I would imagine the cortisol levels are, are very high, and the way we would mitigate it is training, uh, those, it's certainly for those first couple of weeks in space. Um, and then for a return to Earth, we have everybody helping us. <laughs> um, so I don't know that NASA has come up with solutions for, for that particular uh, uh, case. Uh, for young children, but um, training certainly is, is our solution for what happens to astronauts when they get into space. Thanks, Tom. You've already answered Jennifer Graham's question, which was, uh, what time zone do you operate in? So you operate in the Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, That's right. Colin Perry is still on the screen with uh, Callum here, was asking, what happens to your blood pressure whilst in zero gravity and on your return? Uh, that uh, tracks quite a bit, actually. As you may know, uh, every, you get a fluid shift, everything goes up towards your head because your cardiovascular system is geared to do that on the, in, on the gravity field of Earth, and so it's still doing that when you get to space. <clears throat> but uh, we do undergo some physiologic changes to get some of the fluid off. We have a total body loss, a water loss of about 15%. And so the blood pressure, it uh, mounts appropriately for the exercise. It just runs right up. But the diastolic and systolic are a little bit lower when you're at rest as compared to the ground. Um, that probably speaks to the, uh, the really relaxed state that you can get. Even when you're doing your normal work, you, you're doing less total body work uh, just floating in space than everyone is sitting in a chair. And then you, you would even uh, do lying, on, lying in bed. So. Um, uh, the, the blood pressure is a little bit less while you're at rest, uh, but mounts just uh, just right when you uh, start to work out. Yeah, quite amazing, really amazing. Belinda Robertson's come back. So again, Belinda's uh, one of the leaders in the uh, Early Years Collaborative, and she's saying, thanks, Tom. This is to the point around cortisol. Thanks, Tom. Fascinating to think what it might be like, like what it might be like to be born again. A great analogy to help us better understand what very small children experience regularly when they live in high stress environments. Fascinating. We're getting a lot of very positive feedback on Twitter. Twitter's gone mad here. Uh, I noticed that NASA had, has 27 million followers, so we've got some work to do there, Jennifer and uh, Alex. Um, now, Jackie Welsh is the clinical lead at the um, HSC Safety Forum in Northern Ireland. Um, we were talking a little bit of banter there about space tourism. Um, and we're offering uh, Jason Leach, our National Clinical Director, uh, to go as a space tourist. Uh, Jackie says she's up for it uh, for uh, research purposes. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on space tourism, uh, Tom? Very excited about it. It's, it's going to become a reality here very soon. You may know that Boeing and uh, SpaceX 
um, and uh, Sierra Nevada is another one, are three companies that are going to be uh, launching people into space with the space station as the destination. There's others, Blue Origins who, and um, uh, Virgin Galactic, they're going to be doing suborbital flights to bring people in space. We're excited because when more people can fly in space, you start to drive more innovation, more people uh, using the, the market as, as a means of uh, growing their companies, maintaining efficiencies, and bringing down the cost. It's expensive to fly in space. Bringing down the cost will get more people up there. It's also fascinating, I think, from a medical standpoint, uh, companies have been using, um, working with flight surgeons to really better understand the limits of human tolerance. If somebody is 90 years old and wants to fly in space, well, they're going to accommodate, these private companies will accommodate them, and they'll do the studies. Uh, so there have been studies out there that have looked at the effects of a of a launch profile in a centrifuge on, uh, I think uh, one gentleman was in, in his 90s that underwent that. And so these are people who are actually pushing the barriers of our knowledge of, of what humans can tolerate at, at the extremes of, of age and, and even of health. So um, it's all very exciting. Wow. So uh, that, that's, that is exciting. It's exciting to hear how we'll continue to learn through space tourism as well. And yes, Jason, we were only joking. We need you back on, on terra firma. Um, so we've got a question here um, uh, around how do uh, um, how much do astronauts have into future improvements in space travel or within the spaceship environment? So how do we capture your learning and improve? And uh, you're talking about uh, living in space or actual development of the, the hardware? Yeah, I think it's to do with the whole piece around your experience and living in space. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, passing them down is, is even a challenge at the Johnson Space Center where we have, um, where we're still learning and getting better at capturing comments from astronauts, which come down almost daily. But making sure we capture them, we have a database, it's a searchable database, we can uh, uh, look at over the years. We're going to have an a incredibly rich database looking at over the years and uh, better understanding for these next spacecraft um, how best to, to build them, how best to uh, have crews live and work aboard them. So that's all happening at the Johnson Space Center. and. Uh, NASA has been very open with this information when companies have come to NASA to, to ask um, for advice on these types of things. Uh, so astronauts uh, and engineers, um, civil servants have been involved with <clears throat> all of the companies, uh, giving them advice and trying to, trying to give out that information to those companies. Uh, I, for one, really enjoy just reading the general literature. I know Scott Kelly's got a new book out. <clears throat> there are others that have uh, astronauts that have published books, and uh, I've, I actually learn a little bit of something every time I read one. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, Tina Ryan, the uh, Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow, uh, Geriatric Registrar in the West of Scotland. Uh, this is to you know, how do you live and and experience the living in close environment? She says, how do you cope living in a small space uh, with three people for six months? It's um, better than you might imagine, I think. You do get isolated. Uh, the culture of the crew is the way you begin to feel uh, is, is the, uh, the culture of, of the world in a way. Um, that is, you know, the news you get from the ground, the, uh, the attitudes of the crew, how we're working with the ground, the work ethic on board the space station. Um, that becomes your, your full reality after a while. Um, but it's not, it's not lonely by any means. Um, that is, uh, yes, we do have our crewmates with us. Yes, it is a small spot. But for one thing, you've got zero G, so it's even if a module is the size of a room that you're in, imagine being able to float up to the ceiling and what you could do with all that space. So that's, uh, it's not as uh, confined as you might imagine. <clears throat> but um, I would, I would say that being able to talk to uh, uh, scientists and engineers on the ground as we do our experiments uh, is actually a vibrant uh, place to, to live and work. The challenge is going to be when we leave low Earth orbit, get to the moon and, and further from there, when we can't have real-time conversations and the view out the window is not going to show us the gorgeous Earth because we're too far away. That's going to be the huge um, psycho-behavioral challenge of going to Mars. 
Thanks, Tom. And we have Lynn Smith, who's a cancer audit facilitator in NHS Borders. And Lynn's asking, what's the first thing you like to do when you return home to Earth? Uh, see your family. So that, that takes 24 hours to get from Kazakhstan to uh, to back home. Um, but we are, are able to talk to them on a satellite phone right away. Um, then a, a shower, I put in second priority order. If you haven't had a, a good hot shower for half a year. <clears throat> and for me, a big sandwich was next. Uh, for me, a sandwich embodies everything you miss, fresh bread, fresh vegetables, uh, that sort of thing. Being able to mix your food uh, without making a mess. So putting all that together in a sandwich uh, was just wonderful. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now we have a, we have a great uh, a great question here from Joseph Tahin. Uh, Joseph was a, a visiting leadership fellow with us at Healthcare Improvement Scotland and has now uh, returned to his native uh, Montreal. And uh, we miss you, Joseph. But thanks for the question. Joseph is asking: uh, Is there a dedicated quality control department at NASA, or is it everyone's business? It is everyone's business. Uh, we don't have a dedicated department for that in particular. I'm looking at Nigel, yeah, and, and he's saying, yeah, we do. So that means they do their <laughs> job so well, they're uh, invisible and in the background. Uh, uh, but I think everybody feels, uh, certainly feels responsible for, for that. Um, and so we are, and I, and I do know as I've worked with uh, just going out to visit vendors and companies that are supplying, you know, bringing materials and supplies uh, for the space station, that indeed I, I know we have a very robust department that's watching uh, outside vendors uh, to make sure that, that everything is, is working as it should be. And that's, that's very robust and, uh, and very prominent. Uh, but certainly everybody feels uh, feels uh, very deep in their soul about uh, quality control when it comes to working with uh, the space flight. And, uh, this has been a QI Connector first. So Nigel, let's bring you into the call. So welcome to Dr. Nigel Packham, who's the manager of the Flight Safety Office and coming over to Scotland shortly. Uh, hi Nigel, any thoughts on, on that? There's a great comment here from Aileen that when Aileen visited with you, uh, she said that it was uh, it was very clear it was everyone's business. Absolutely, Brian, and, uh, and, and hi again to Aileen. Um, I, I will say that, in fact, even in my own organization, we have um, teams dedicated to looking at, at, to assure the quality of the hardware, the software, um, of the foods that Tom ate, for example, um, all the experiments that he performed, all go through a very rigorous quality control process before they go up to the space station for to, to ensure not only are they going to work when they get up there, uh, but also that they will be efficient in terms of Tom's time, since the astronaut's time is very, very valuable. Uh, we want to make sure that they can do the experiments in as, in as quick a time as possible while still maintaining, obviously, the scientific rigor. Thanks very much for that, Nigel, and more about Nigel uh, a bit later on. Now, there's a number of people asking what, where to next. So uh, Maggie Watts, the Director of Public Health in Western Isles, uh, what do you see as the next important medical advance linked to space, either travel, space travel, or being in space? That's a, a great question. I think there's going to be medical advances that are will come out from the research of the space station, um, and we can talk about that. Uh, hard to predict those things. Uh, advances come about when you didn't, you know, if, if you pay smart people to do uh, solve difficult problems and tell them uh, this is to uh, further our um, travel into into the universe, then people uh, do amazing things, and we found out a lot of great things so far. Uh, what we need to figure out for going into deep space, solving the radiation problem, how we can uh, prevent um, either treat radiation uh, events if they occur, say if we were hit by a solar flare, um, but also just to protect us from the general radiation environment. That's one big thing. The other is, as I mentioned, the psychological effects of being truly isolated and alone, far from Earth, with being unable to have a real-time conversation with someone. We'd just be having recorded videos and recorded video, um, recorded audio conversations with 
with people back on Earth and maintaining that connection. Uh, one thing that's fascinating from a, from a medical care standpoint in my mind is providing medical care on that trip. That is, uh, you, you can't turn around and come home. <clears throat> so do we fly um, uh, one medical doctor? Do we fly two? Does everyone need to also have a medical background? What kind of surgery would we uh, think we would need to be able to do? Probably would not have an operating suite. Um, in my mind, the interventional radiology techniques would be make most sense. It's got to be lightweight, low power, uh, not take up much volume. And uh, even if you had the world's best physicians on board, they probably had not seen a patient for at least a year uh, by the time they had to use their skills. So how do you maintain those skills? Those are uh, uh, innovations that were, are things that we're coming up with today. We're not there yet, um, but um, it'll be very interesting to see what, the, what we come up with by the time we're on our way to Mars. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. And uh, Anna Edwards uh, comes up with the, I think, the question of the uh, question of the uh, of the session. Strategy manager at the Care Quality Commission in uh, England. Would you entertain having a, sp a space station dog, or would they struggle up there? A space station dog. We would certainly entertain it because it would be wonderful <laughs> to have a, a furry friend there. Um, it would be very difficult to manage because. Uh, I, dogs are, might be easier to train than astronauts, but maybe not. But we, we have trained to use the, uh, the uh, waste containment system, if you will. And um, if we have, because we, we've had uh, uh, mammals, other animals on board the space station, and the shuttle would bring them back and look at the effects. And typically those are, are very high maintenance missions. So um, it, would, it would impact operations. It would have a lot of benefit uh, as well. Um, one astronaut was tweeting from the space station about four years ago. There was a spider, a couple of spiders on board, and they, they felt a personal connection with them after a while. See what they were doing, what they were building, as uh, treated them as uh, almost as like one of their crewmates. So the uh, psychological benefit would be huge. <laughs> yeah, I'm not so sure about spiders. Fancy the dog, but not necessarily spiders. So listen, final question from uh, Jackie Well, Sorry, Jackie, I placed you in Northern Ireland, but of course you're an improvement advisor in Ayrshire and Arran here in Scotland. Um, Jackie's asking, uh, Tom, when is your next mission and for how long and are you constantly prepping for this? Yes, we are constantly prepping for it. About 20% of our time is spent getting ready to be a or to maintain our capability of being assigned. Um, so we, uh, we fly our T-38 jets. We practice our spacewalks in a big pool near here. We're always studying Russian, uh, practicing on that robotic arm, trying to stay in shape. But that's about 20% of our time. Otherwise, we are helping our colleagues fly in space. Um, and uh, the, my prospects are the same as for everyone's right now. When a seat opens up, and we don't know when that's going to be next, uh, then I'm in line. There's, uh, you know, it's always the problem of do you build your experience or do you use it? I've got experience now, so I would only fly if they needed a veteran to be up there, say, either in a commander position or if something were to go wrong and they need someone who did not require a lot of training, they just put them a quick, in a quick flow to get up to the space station. So uh, it's all up in the air, but you know what? That's, that's what space flight is all about. And if you can't be flexible with that, then it's, it's not the right job for you. Wonderful, Tom. It's all up in the air. That's what space flight is all about. I'm going to quote you on that. Listen, we've got the, the chat box has been full. Twitter has gone mad. Uh, Richard Norris, a visiting fellow at the Academy of Government at uh, Edinburgh University, has been asking what's been the, the biggest challenge about going into space. I think you've shared with us many of those challenges throughout the call today. It um, just uh, remains for me to thank you very much on behalf of uh, QI Connect. I'd also like to just thank, uh, we've heard already on the call today from uh, Nigel Packham, and a big shout out to Nigel. Uh, Nigel's been amazingly helpful in connecting, and not only with Tom, uh, but also more widely in NASA. And Nigel is coming to Scotland. Uh, and uh, we have a session with uh, Nigel that we'll be running on uh, WebEx uh, on the 8th of November. So just two weeks' time, and we'll send out the details to uh, all of our QI connectors across the globe. We're really looking forward to seeing you, uh, Nigel. This is such an exciting time for us here in Scotland. And a big shout out to Sally Magnuson. Uh, Sally is a well-known television and radio presenter and author uh, here in Scotland, across the UK, and more widely afield. And 
Sally's giving our final QI Connect talk of 2017. Uh, she has an amazing story to tell about dementia, about her mother's uh, dementia, and about the power of music in transforming the lives of people with dementia, their families and carers. It's going to be astounding. We're really looking forward to that. And just as we close today and come to the top of the hour, just to remind everyone, everyone of the amazing QI Connect uh, lineup, uh, we focused on innovation, on improvement and on integration. Uh, and uh, what a beautiful uh, lineup we've had this year. So it just remains for me to thank you all. Please follow us on Twitter at HISQI Connect. Let's hit that 27 million Twitter followers that NASA have. Let's try and beat them next time. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to the QI Connect team here. And thanks to you QI Connectors all over the world. Thank you very much.